Get my six. <laughs> Greetings, everybody. <clears throat> Welcome back to homesteading off the grid into another beautiful, glorious October afternoon, October night by the time you're seeing this video. Mmm. Mmm. That's still some delicious coffee. The warmth of which is even much more appreciated on a now brisk October afternoon. Temperatures have dropped. <sighs> Let's get right to it. This is something that's been frustrating me for more than a year now. It's October 19th and our story is called Monkey Business. <sighs> if you think about it, it doesn't take you long to remember where or how or under what circumstances you met most of the people you know. Oh yeah, we might say when asked about George. I know George from school. Our kids have been in the same classes together since kindergarten. And then there's Nancy. Oh yeah, Nancy. Nancy and I took an oil painting class together that one time. She was really shy until her second glass of wine, then she became the class clown. And then there are people like my friend Robert. I have known Robert for many years, at least 20, but I cannot tell you where, how, or under what circumstances I met him because Robert is so uniquely vivacious that once you've spent time with him, you don't remember much of anything about where you were or what you were doing or how you'd ended up there in the first place. You simply remember Robert. Now, I wanna make sure you hear all about Robert, so I'm gonna move the camera a little bit closer because that wind's picking up and the, the leaves are rattling and it sounds beautiful and also I wanted to get a slightly different angle because I thought I'd detect the movement off to my right, your left. Something which may now be throwing something at us. Case in point, Robert and I ran into each other one day a few years back while we were both downtown simply walking around and enjoying a beautiful spring day after a particularly long and cold winter. We were both delighted to see each other, so we took up with each other and continued walking and fell into conversation as fluidly as we'd fallen into step. Check this place out, Robert said as we pulled up to a small mom and pop toy store. I'd be hard pressed to find the place again because with Robert as my partner, I'd not even noticed where exactly we'd walked or how long it had taken us to get there. We'd been talking about the possibilities of time travel, aliens, and other such questionable topics. Robert, not too unlike myself, has some very odd interests, and I believe it's one of the reasons we get along so well. I've never been in a toy store before, Robert said. We should check this place out. Okay, I said, let's check it out. I figured if nothing else, I could take my son there sometime when we were in town, and I thought about doing so, but case in point, I can't remember which street the store was even on. Robert and I walked into the store, and we were greeted by the proprietor, a very attractive woman in her early 70s, about the same age as Robert. You could tell the lady spent no less time making herself up each morning before going out for her day as any young woman fresh to the workforce. Yet she hadn't overdone it, like many young ladies to whom fixing upping before outings is too new. She looked respectable, classy, and not to sound redundant, but to respectfully point out the fact again, beautiful. Do you have any children, the lady said as she approached us, or grandchildren? I do, I said. I have a ten-year-old son. I'll have to bring him in here. How about you, she asked Robert as if I'd not even spoken, and at this point I'll mention that she'd never taken her eyes off of Robert since we'd walked into the shop. I would say he's a good-looking guy, no doubt, but there's something more than just good looks about Robert. When you see him, you don't just see his physical attributes. You can somehow see his radiant personality, even if he is, hasn't spoken yet. Perhaps aura would be a better word. Yes, that's it. Robert has a very brilliant aura. I don't know, Robert said. You don't know if you have children or grandchildren, the lady asked. Yeah, he said. I mean, I don't think I do, but I'm in my 70s, and I spent a lot of time in rock bands back in the 60s and 70s. Oh, you did, the lady said. 
And I had to do a double take because I had never seen a woman of that age look at a man of that same age with the eyes of a college age girl ready to sow some oats with one of the guys from the football team before. And that's exactly how this lady was looking at Robert. I mean, Robert, just with his presence and a few simple statements, was turning this woman on. I mean, I was mostly responsible, Robert said, but there were always those times when the music was just right and the atmosphere was perfect and everyone was having just a little too much fun and, well, you know, things happen and I might have some kids or grandkids out there. Maybe someday someone will approach me and let me know I'm their father or their grandfather, but it hasn't happened yet. Believe it or not, even though that is exactly how Robert started the conversation with this beautiful older lady running the toy store, it worked better than my old favorite pickup lines I used to use back in the day before I was married. I used to slip up to a beautiful girl at a bar or in a bookstore and say, hey baby, I'd like to buy you a fish sandwich. I mean, yeah, I stole that line from a movie and sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. But anyway, the next thing I know, we're leaving the toy store that day because the woman was locking up early to go home with Robert. One of the odd parts about the, the relationship between Robert and me is that I had never had his phone number, nor did I even know where he lived for years. I would just run into him, and most of the time it was when I really needed someone to talk to, but I didn't know who to call. Robert would just show up in my life. I pointed this out to him on more than one occasion and he would say, it's the universe, man. It puts people in your life when you need them, man. Isn't it groovy? This is a real person. This is a true story. Robert, you know what? Sidebar, because I got to take a drink of coffee anyway. I've, I've been meaning to get a copy of one, one of these books in Robert's hands because this is his story. I have it. I'm keeping one in the truck because I have every reason to believe I'm just going to just mysteriously run into him before October is over because it's the universe, man. It's groovy. In time, I would get to know a little more about Robert, like where he was from, Albemarle County, Virginia, what kind of work he did outside of playing in the occasional rock band during his youth. He didn't work because, as you'll soon find out, he never had to, though he did and still does a lot of volunteer work for worthy causes. And more about his personal interests, which, like mine, include mountain biking, running, and hiking. At one point, he was actually near a, he was a near national level endurance street, like road cyclist. Yeah. I never knew you were a runner, Robert told me on the day of this great discovery of common interests. But you're built like one, so it makes sense. I just learned not to assume anything about anybody years ago. I asked a guy that looked like a boxer once if he was a boxer, and he punched me in the face. I was afraid that if I asked you if you were a runner, that you might run away and I'd never see you again. Okay, so I guess you could say Robert is a little weird. Well, we'll use the word eccentric, because actually Robert, not unlike many of our neighbors here in Albemarle County, Virginia, comes from a long line of generational wealth. His family, 25 generations ago, had actually been granted 5,000 acres of land by King James. Keep getting my six. You clearly had to have heard that twig snap. Something is walking in the forest off beside me here, and I'm seeing nothing. The veil is thin, and things are slipping through like the October Rider who came through to hear a story just last week. All right, so yes, the very King James who the Christian Bible, who had the Christian Bible reassembled. But please don't point that out to any Baptist that the King James Bible is not the original version of the Bible. And as you know, someone is only weird if they're poor. If they're weird and they have money, then they are eccentric. So yes, Robert was and still is, since he's still among the living is, as of this writing, eccentric. Hey, man, Robert said to me recently when we ran into each other in town. I was hoping I'd see you, man. I've got a place I want to take you mountain biking. Where is it, I asked. On the back 40 of some of my land. Awesome, I said. And we made arrangements to get together at one of his back 40s. He has several. Soon thereafter. Do me a favor, Robert said on the day we got together to bike on his family's land. The location is less than 20 minutes from my house. 
Though I'd had a general idea of how much land Robert owned by this point in our relationship, I had no idea just how big that much land was. We were literally three miles away from his house, and he still owned this land as well as all the land in between. Don't bring any electronic devices, Robert told me. Like, leave your smartphone in the truck. Okay, I said, thinking nothing of it. I just assumed maybe Robert didn't want Google listening to any of our conversations. So I'm thinking about selling this tract, he told me once we'd biked for only a couple of minutes. The land was beautiful. It was mostly fields which local farmers leased from Robert for hay. In time, though, the trails would lead into the forest, and what a beautiful forest it was. There were streams, small ponds, and several old homestead sites. It was mid-October, and the leaves were in their full autumn glory, and it looked and felt as if we were biking through the middle of a Thomas Kincaid painting. It's like the setting, the setting behind us here. Robert explained how he didn't need the money from a land sale. The same fam family had been leasing this portion of land from his family for a couple of generations, and he'd gotten close with the man from the other family who was about 20 years younger than him, and he wanted to allow the guy to own the land because the land had been special to his family for so long. It's about a 50-acre track, Robert said, but I have some misgivings. Hard to part with it after having it in the family for so long, I asked. No, Robert said, I think this portion of the land is haunted by something in particular, and I can't in good conscience pass the land on, even by way of a sale, if this is the case. Robert, I said, all land is haunted. It's just, as you know, some people can see and hear the things that others can't. You shouldn't let that stop you if you want to do it. Just do me a favor, Robert said. While we're out here, let me know if you see or hear or feel anything out of the norm. I agree with you. Some of us can see and hear that which others cannot, but it doesn't mean that we can all see and hear the same thing. Do you know what I mean? Not really, I said. Look, it's like this. It's like you might be able to see and hear certain spirits or energies because they choose to allow you to see and hear them. Well, that same spirit or energy source just might not like me. Maybe they don't like the way my face looks, so they won't allow me to see them or hear them. Ah, I said, I get it, and I did. A few moments later, while I was biking just in front of Robert, I came to a sudden stop, as I thought I'd seen something. Some, somewhat small and very dark, weaving in and out of the tree line about a hundred yards away from us. What do you see, Robert said, pulling up beside me with the excitement of a kid walking into a toy store, or in Robert's case, with the excitement of a 70-something-year-old man walking into a toy store for a hot hookup with a beautiful 70-something-year-old cashier in a toy store. I think it's a turkey, I said, and sure enough, it was. We looked on as a young gobbler, known as a tom, made its way in and out of the forest, no doubt catching and eating grasshoppers and crickets at the forest's edge. Ten minutes later, I pulled up to a sudden stop again. And just like before, Robert pulled up beside me, all excited, and asked, What did you see? What did you see? I think it was a deer, I said, and sure enough, the deer I'd seen, which had walked behind a bramble thicket, revealed itself by walking out the other side. Oh, Robert said, and he sounded really deflated. Tell you what, Robert said, sometime later after we'd returned to our vehicles, why don't you do me a favor? Could you come out here by yourself and bike or jog or something and see if you see anything when I'm not with you? I think this thing hates me and just isn't going to reveal itself if I'm around. What should I be looking for, Robert? I asked. You'll know it when you see it, he said. There's no confusing it for anything else. And if you'll come out by yourself at least once, I'll tell you what's up, whether you see it or not. Okay, I said, how about I come out tomorrow? I've got to run five miles per my training schedule. I can run here. That sounds great, he said. Just remember, leave your phone in your truck. No electronic devices. Give me a call after you've come out and let me know how it went and I'll fill you in. Okay, I said. And it was only then, after having been friends with this eccentric man for many, many years, that I finally got his phone number. The next day, I did what I'd said I would do. I went back to Robert's land for my morning five-mile run. Sure, I didn't have any distance measured off, but any runner knows what knows that you simply run for a select period of time based on the pace you're running to determine your distance. I typically train at eight minutes per mile pace. Yes, I'm older and slower than I used to be, so 40 minutes of running on, on Robert's land would suffice. The run went smoothly and it was very enjoyable. I saw plenty of squirrels and rabbits and deer. 
But then when I got back to my truck, I saw what, what could have only been one thing, a monkey. Yes, it appeared as if a monkey was sitting on the ground just a few feet away from the driver's side door of my truck. As I walked slowly toward the truck from a distance of about 50 yards away, the point where I'd stopped running, the monkey went up underneath my truck and then seemed to come out the other side and then head down into the meadow, which extended for 100 yards or so before meeting the forest. No one is going to believe this if I don't get a picture, I said. And I opened my truck and took out my smartphone and then went to where it appeared the monkey had gone. I looked and looked, and sure enough, sitting just at the edge of the forest now, about 60 yards away from me, was the monkey. I held my phone up, zoomed in on the monkey, and said, smile, and took its picture. And then the strangest thing happened. I got shocked somehow by my phone, something that has never happened, and the monkey vanished. What the? I said aloud. I looked back to the edge of the forest, and sure enough, the monkey was not to be seen. I even used my phone's camera and zoomed in for a clearer look in the area, and again, no monkey. It must have hopped into the woods, I said, again aloud, and yes, I talk to myself often because I always get the answers I want to hear when I do. I made it home shortly after my run, and I called Robert, but he didn't answer. I was determined to call him later in the day because it was still early, but I didn't. The thought of calling him simply dropped out of my mind. I'd gotten busy doing other things. I enjoyed the rest of my day with my wife and our son, and since it was a school night, we were in bed with the lights out by 9 p.m., like the well-conditioned public school family that we are. And then, at 3 o'clock a.m., yes, the very witching hour, it happened. From out of nowhere, I was awakened by the sound of a basketball highlights video on YouTube, playing from what sounded like our living room. Our son loves basketball, and he's always watching those sorts of videos on our laptops. And my first thought was, why in the hell is he up at 3 o'clock in the morning? And by the way, folks, this story is entirely 100,000% true. I went into the living room and my son was not there. There was a small lamp on the bookshelf that we kept on at night, giving off its dim glow, but no other lights were on. I was looking for the light from the laptop screen. My laptop was lying on an end table by the couch and it was turned off and closed. My wife's laptop, however, was sitting on her desk that we keep set up in the far corner of the living room beside the wood stove, where she loves to sit in the winter to stay as warm as possible. My wife is from the South Pacific, the Philippines, and despite having lived in Virginia for five years by the time of these events, she still hadn't gotten used to North American winters. Do you ever? I made my way to my wife's desk and sat down to turn off her laptop. The sound of the video was clearly blaring from her laptop, but that's when I realized that though her laptop screen, screen was raised, the computer itself appeared to be off. I ran my finger over the mouse pad and the laptop, which had not been powered off, but which clearly had been asleep, came to life. Even then, I saw no video, rather the box into which I needed to put my wife's password to access the laptop. I put in the password. We both know all of each other's passwords. We keep no secrets between us. And the computer came to life, and the video I'd heard was playing. I turned it off, shut down the laptop, and was determined not to tell my wife and kid about what had happened. The next day, however, I told my wife, but not my kid. Remember, no secrets. My wife thought that perhaps... Tree knocks. My wife thought that perhaps I'd dream the whole thing. So we turned her laptop on, went to YouTube, and selected history. Sure enough, the basketball video had been played the night before at approximately 3 o'clock a.m. Just as my wife and I were trying to figure out what sort of electrical tomfoolery must have taken place for this to have happened, my phone rang. It was Robert. I told him my run had gone well, and when he asked if I'd seen anything out of the ordinary, I mentioned the monkey. Oh my God, you actually saw it! Okay, so here's the story. I'll give you the short version, because if you think I'm long-winded... You have no clue. My friend Robert is even more long-winded than I am. 
As it turns out, more than a century and a half ago, one of Robert's ancestors who lived on the portion of the land in question had been a widower. When he was in his mid-50s, he took on a second wife. This wife was much younger than him. She'd actually been a childhood friend of his daughter. And before you judge, understand that this was not an uncommon practice in 1850s America. The second wife wanted children, but alas, it turned out she couldn't have them. Obviously, the problem was not with her husband, as he'd already fathered two children. So feeling bad about herself, the woman went into a deep depression. Her husband was often gone on business, and when he was gone, she would become very lonely and her depression would worsen, often to the point of having suicidal ideologies. Being that her husband was a man of means and a bit eccentric, it must run in the family, I thought, he'd bought her a pet monkey to keep her company while he was away on business. The woman fell in love with the monkey and treated it as if it were her child. Once, after returning from a business trip, the husband noticed that the monkey was wearing a beautiful necklace as a collar. When asked where the necklace had come from, the wife told of how a traveling salesman had come through the area, a man about her age, and, and gave her the necklace. He gave you the necklace? The husband said, unable to figure out why she hadn't bought it. They had plenty of money and could have easily afforded it. To make what was supposed to be a short story but isn't, shorter, hopefully, the husband became jealous, assuming something else had gone on between his beautiful young bride and the traveling salesman. In a fit of rage, he strangled the monkey. This, of course, threw the wife completely over the edge. That night, she made the choice to take her own life. This, in turn, threw the jealous husband over the edge, and he did the same. Robert claims that for more than a century and a half, people have reported seeing a monkey on this portion of the land. Well, he said, after telling me the history of the monkey, at least you didn't have any electronic devices with you when you saw it. And why is that a good thing, I asked, keeping my cards close to my chest. You know, Kev, he said, these things can hop into your electronics and go home with you. So whatever you do, whenever you go out there, if you see that monkey again, don't try to get a picture or any video footage of it for that wacky-ass YouTube channel of yours. Okay, I said. For nearly a year now, I've been being woken up at 3 o'clock in the morning by the alternating sounds of pictures falling off the walls, dishes falling off the shelves in the kitchen, laptops and cell phones being turned on and playing the music videos. And once, I was even awakened by the sound of the toilet flushing, even though my wife and son were in bed, deeply asleep at all of these times. All I can figure is that if I can just get another picture of that damn monkey or some video footage, I can take my smartphone back out to Robert's and just throw it out into the forest and leave it there. Hence, I've been running around my damn house trying to get a picture of it, but alas, the little bastard is much faster than I am. I'm not giving up, though. I am determined because I am sick and tired of all of this monkey business. The End so thank you for joining me for another story from October Nights, Part 2, 31 More Tales for the Halloween Season, available with an autograph from our Etsy store. The link is in the description box below. You can get copies in Kindle or print from Amazon, or you can continue to come back every night and just listen to me read the stories here. Listen, tomorrow, October 20, one of my favorite stories in the book is going to be read. It's a story called... Stick a hick. Was it originally titled something else? No. But listen, I want you to Google a word and learn its meaning before tomorrow's reading. The word is called facetious. Facetious. Okay, this is one of two stories in the book that I dedicate to the everlasting memory of the, the, the legend the, 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 and the prophet, George Carlin. Stick a hick. Tomorrow night, see you then. Go find out what the word facetious means so you're not too butthurt when you hear the story.